Hey, and welcome to the second short lecture from Chapter 9. So picking up where we left off in the, in the last short lecture, we were talking about uh, some of the reasons uh, why, we're, why we uh, choose the, the relational partners that we do. And we were speaking specifically about similarity. And we know that we're attracted to people who are, who are similar to ourselves. And so some scientists have, have theorized that uh, the reason that this occurs is related to what they call implicit egotism. So uh, this, is, this is a fancy term for uh, narcissism or a kind of uh, uh, egotism that exists under the surface. Uh, subconscious egotism might be another way to put it. Uh, so the idea uh, behind this is that uh, we're attracted to similar others because it provides us with the means of ego support. We, we like ourselves, and when we find other people like ourselves, whose, whose characteristics are similar, it, it helps, uh, helps bolster our, our ideas of ourselves. Uh, so uh, there are all kinds of studies into implicit egotism that have revealed some, some surprising results. For example, we know that we're disproportionately likely to marry other people whose first or last name resembles our own. So uh, because my name is Eric, there is a disproportionate chance uh, that I would marry someone named Erica, for example. We also know from these studies that we're attracted to people who share similar birthdays, the date or, or the month. We're attracted to jobs or occupations that are similar to our names. So for example, uh, there are a disproportionate number of people named Baker who are bakers by trade. There is a disproportionate number of people with the last name Judge who become judges. We know that we like the letters in our names better than the other letters in the alphabet. If you just give people a random list of letters and tell them to rank them, which ones they like best and which ones they like least, they'll always pick the letters in their name without thinking about it. That's what makes it implicit or, or subconscious. Right? They'll always pick the letters in their name uh, and, and say that they like those letters better than the other letters. Also, and this one is, is really interesting to me, we like things better if they're ours, if they belong to us. So, you know, we all are familiar with this phenomenon, right? Uh, maybe you worked really hard <coughs> and got yourself a car. <coughs> Excuse me. And it might not be the slickest car in the world. Maybe it's, it's, maybe it's a junky car, but it's your car, and you love it because it belongs to you. If you saw somebody else driving it, you would never comment on it ever. You know, maybe you saved up a bunch of money and you got yourself a nice Toyota Camry or a nice Honda Accord or a nice Honda Civic. That's cool. Nobody's got a poster of a Honda Civic in their bedroom, right? No one's got a, a poster of a, of a Honda Accord uh, in the room growing up. These aren't the kinds of cars that, that people normally love, but it isn't unusual at all for you to really love your Accord because it belongs to you. Now, another, another point with regard to similarity is that uh, our attraction is greatest when we share a number of things, right, or a number of similarities with another person. So if we both share the, you know, the birthday month of May, that might not be enough to create a real love connection. But if you throw in a bunch of other factors, hey, we both have brown hair, uh, you know, we're both in the same religion, we're both, uh, you know, have the same level of education, uh, you know, once you, once you get enough of these commonalities or enough of these similarities together, then, then the attraction becomes stronger and stronger. Now, interestingly, similarity can quickly turn to dislike. If we find people who remind us of ourselves, but then have one really bad kind of socially offensive characteristic. So let's say you meet someone who really is similar to you in a lot of ways, but they're obnoxious when they go to a restaurant, or they're a bad drunk, or they're, uh, you know, they're, rude to, uh, they're rude to kids. I don't know, right? I mean, pick your, pick your socially offensive thing. But if there's that one thing that stands out, then we really dislike those people. We dislike them more intensely than we do people who are different from us in a lot of ways and have that characteristic. And the idea behind this is that it reminds us of things that might be wrong with ourselves. You know, we might secretly be as awful as they are and not know it, right? 
And this really stands out to us when we meet other people who are similar to us in many ways, but importantly diverge in, in ways that are socially offensive. Uh, and, and this becomes readily apparent to us. So another factor that, that's important to talk about is the, the factor of complementarity. So as I said earlier uh, in, the, in the previous short lecture, you know, there, we've often been told that opposites attract, and this is generally untrue. Uh, we, we like people who are like us. Now, that said, there are some times when opposites do attract, and that's when, when our characteristics complement one another. So, for example, if one person in the relationship is really passive, you know, they don't want to decide where to go to dinner, they, they uh, want someone to tell them what to do, they want, and the other person is, is very dominant, they're very aggressive, right? And, and they, want to, they want to set the agenda for everybody, they want to tell everybody what to do, they want to make all the decisions. Sometimes, in a situation like that, the relationship could really work out well. And that's known as complementarity, right? So, so over time, these kinds of relationships can work. However, strains occur, there's, there's strife or there's problems with the relationships when these differences are disputed. So, for example, if one person in the relationship really likes to spend a lot and the other person really is, is tight with money and likes to save, that can cause a serious problem. So even, even when you know, we say with complementarity opposites can attract, there's still many points where, where the way people are opposite from one another just simply isn't complementary. And so as a result, it leads to serious, serious issues in the relationship. Now successful couples are those who adjust for both similarities and for their differences over time. Right? They're able to, to adjust their relationship and the way they communicate with one another in order to take these things into account. So another important reason why we choose relational partners is what's known as reciprocal attraction. Uh, put simply, we like people who like us. You've probably had first-hand experience with this. Back in high school and middle school, you find out that somebody likes you, right? And I'm making little quotes with my fingers. You can't see me, but I am. So when you find out somebody likes you, all of a sudden you might think, oh, wow, I never thought about them. Yeah, they're, they're cute. So that, that whole line of reasoning is based on the idea that we're attracted to people who are attracted to us. You might not have ever thought about that person as a potential uh, relational partner, but once you find out they like you, hey, they're not too bad, are they? So we like people who like us, and this is particularly true in the early stages of the relationship. When we find out that people like us, it helps bolster our self-esteem. It makes us feel better about ourselves. It confirms our idea that the self, our presenting self, the one that we put out there in the world, the way that we act to others, it convinces us that that's, that's a, we're doing a good job with that, that we're presenting ourselves in a good way. It reaffirms the idea that, hey, I'm a likable person. Now, in general, we like people who like us. However, if their idea of us, right? If what they say about us conflicts with our own self-concept. For example, if someone keeps telling me how handsome I am, if I think I'm really ugly, then we're going to end up disliking them. We don't like people who tell us things that we think are disingenuous or untrue or cause us what's known as cognitive dissonance, right? That, that send us confusing messages or, or messages that are at odds with our own view of who we are. Now, competence is another reason we're attracted to people. We like to be around people who are good at things. We like to be around talented people. Now, that said, sometimes we're uncomfortable around people who are too competent because we feel like they can make us look bad. So, for example, I like to play golf. And I like to play golf with people who are at about the same level that I am, level of skill, uh, and maybe a little bit better. I don't really like playing with the club pro because he's a lot better, and he makes me look bad when we go out there. He outdrives me every time, he outscores me every time. I don't like it, it makes me feel uncomfortable he's so much better. But, but I do like being around people who are competent and who are talented, so long as they're not that much more talented than I am. Also, we like to be around talented people with flaws. We like to be reminded that they're human. 
So maybe some of you remember years ago when we found out, you know, Tiger Woods for a long time could do no wrong. He was like the all-American guy. He was a great golfer, seemed like a, you know, quick and easy smile, seemed like a really friendly person, seemed to have it all. And then one night when his wife went crazy, found out that he'd been cheating on her and smashed up his, his Cadillac with, with his golf clubs, we all kind of enjoyed that for a minute, right? And, of course, that's a kind of uh, what's called schadenfreude or joy in the misfortune of others. But I suggest to you part of the reason that we experienced that joy in his misfortune was the fact that he wasn't perfect. And, and, and that, that, that story reminded us that he wasn't perfect and indicated that he was human. Now, we also like to be around talented people who are, who are really, really good at interpersonal communication, who exhibit a great deal of interpersonal warmth. So if you've ever met someone who's famous uh, and they turn out to be a really nice, friendly person on top of it, then chances are you're just going to love the hell out of them, right? Um, I, I once met John Goodman in a, in a bar in uh, New Orleans. And he was a super nice guy, bought drinks for everybody, bought beers, sat there, drank beers, talked with us. And ever since then, of course, I'm his biggest fan. So this goes to show we're attracted to talented people uh, who appear human, but also talented people who are really friendly and warm and nice to be around. Now, another element that can figure into attraction is disclosure. We, we like it when people share things about themselves with us, particularly if these things fall into the category of self-disclosure, which we've talked about already. So for something to be self-disclosure, or to qualify as self-disclosure. They've got to be intentionally telling us something that we wouldn't otherwise know about them and that's significant, right? So if you tell me your favorite food is pizza, that's not really self-disclosure. But if you, if you tell me, oh, you know, when I was a kid, my mom used to beat on me, right? Like, well, that's self-disclosure. And, and so that, that makes us feel closer to people in part because it's a sign of regard. The fact that someone would share something like that with you makes you like them more and it makes you feel good about yourself it shows that they respect you and that's why they're, they're telling you that now in order for this to to function disclosure has got to be reciprocal meaning that, that both parties have to share because if it's just one person self-disclosing to the other person all the time then it becomes imbalanced right then they begin to think well they don't care about me because they haven't shared anything and i've shared all these things about myself with them and also, through self-disclosure, we can find new similarities. And we already know that similarities breed attraction. All right, and, and another important factor I want to talk about is proximity. Now, proximity is just about being close to someone. We're attracted to people that we're around all the time. Uh, proximity leads to liking. I, I mean, when you think about it, this makes sense. It's hard to be attracted to someone that you're not around right? It's, it's being around someone that gives you the opportunity to see similarities, uh, to, to establish a relationship, etc. So proximity leads to liking. So my advice is, if you've got a crush on someone and you want them to like you, then number one, you should stress your similarities when you're around them, and number two, you should try and be around them as much as possible. Because being around someone leads to liking. So ultimately, uh, many social scientists have boiled down attraction, both romantic and uh, non-romantic kinds of relationships, uh, to what we call social exchange theory. And it's a little cold-blooded, but, but I think it's true. And the theory behind social exchange theory is that we tend to seek out people who can give us rewards that are greater than or equal to the cost we encounter in dealing with them. Now, these are this, this calculation, right, rewards minus costs, equals whether or not we're friends with someone. This calculation is not one that we do consciously, usually, right? It's, it's one that, that, that we, we calculate without even thinking about it many times. It's an unconscious process uh, in which we're, we're trying to figure out, you know, is that person worth the effort? We've all had friends at some point who were too needy, who were too much, and maybe we just stopped hanging out with them. Maybe we weren't even aware that we were stopping hanging out with those people. But it just got to be too much. Right? So social exchange theory is all about deciding if staying in that relationship is worth the effort. And it explains, at least in some cases, why people sometimes stay in abusive relationships. Because maybe they're doing that, that cost-benefit equation in their head 
and, and coming up with the idea, yeah, you know, he's, he's verbally abusive, but, right, if I leave, I won't have the big house, I won't have the car, I won't have the safety, I won't have, right, um, you know, I won't have that, that, that familiarity, I won't have all these other things, right? Um, so, so we measure cost and benefits when we're around people, even if we do it subconsciously. And this figures into, again, social exchange theory. Okay, well, that's it for, for, this, uh, for the second half uh, of this particular topic. And next time we'll talk about models on relational dynamics. Thanks for checking it out.